welcome as well. Um, so before I begin, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Sankova for hosting us this afternoon, to the team and the whole community, and for making copies of the book available to everybody. And thank you to Josh for inviting me to participate in this celebration of his third, yes, that's right, third book of Black Study. So I remember the first time I was introduced to the book. It was the summer of 2019, and Josh wrote to me in an email the following, hey, we talked about this book as a possible book for the Pluto series. I actually have 1.5 of the four main chapters done. I wanted to go ahead and send a specialist though to see what you think and if I should send it officially for consideration. So in the months that followed, Josh, louder? Louder, okay, yes. In the months that followed, Josh would finish two more chapters, and we officially began the process of having it acquired by the Black Critique series at Pluto Press, of which I'm co-editor alongside Anthony Bogues. Now, aside from Josh being a friend, I have always admired his commitment to study. I think we all can see how smart Josh is. In fact, I find myself frustrated at times because see, he won't let the rest of us catch our breath. Three books in three years. The thought alone of doing that makes my brain a short circuit, truly. But this is what happens when your work isn't tied to productivity, but to life work, as Josh's writing shows us. This is what's possible when you think carefully, write with intention, and above all else, when you study. Now, Josh doesn't know this, but this book has done more for me than he realizes. When we officially began the process of acquiring the book for the series, it was a difficult time in my life. I think hands down the most difficult period for me personally. And all I could do was read and read and read, to keep my mind clear and occupied. I must have read those first two chapters of Josh's manuscript maybe 20 times in the first few months of the review process. I felt better, more like myself each time I read it. And talking with Josh about it made me excited about ideas again. I felt less lonely, and above all else, it made me want to write. Shortly after I received the early parts of this book, I dove headfirst into writing my own book. Now, Josh doesn't know this, mm -hmm. but our books are kindred. They're siblings, actually. And I'm deeply thankful for the immense impact he's had on me as a thinker and a friend. I cannot express how wonderful it is to have a friendship born of a shared appreciation for ideas, for beautiful writing, for music, for all things marvelous and real, a friendship born of Black study. Now, this book is mighty. It gives us a genealogy of Black study that dances in a beautiful counterpoint with what we know as Black studies. And like a counterpoint in music, the two, Black studies and Black study, are sometimes harmonious, sometimes dissonant, sometimes running alongside one another without touching, but still held together by a powerful invitation. The desire to really understand, as Sylvia Winter put it, who we are as Black people, as Africans. We come to understand from reading this book right, that Black study dances in and out of the enclosure of Black studies, not unlike Du Bois stepping from within and without, moving, as he calls it, hither and thither from beneath the shadow of the veil. What Josh's book shows us is that it is a conceit of the academy that our work as intellectuals, wherever we might do our work, is to do something new. And this desire for novelty produces an almost pathological impulse to be the first to declare, the first to name. This is, above all else, a colonizing impulse that has impoverished our thinking, and even more, convinced many of us that our task is to discover rather than to study ideas. Of what black of uh, what of black studies remind us, no, not black studies, of black study <laughs> reminds us is that it is not only more robust intellectually to steep oneself in tradition in order to extend, stretch, or play with said tradition, but it is often the only way that newness we are so seduced by comes about. Josh exposes and dwells in the beautiful contradiction that underpins our work as Black intellectuals, that diving into the old is actually what makes any newness possible. He shows what Derek Walcott tells 
when he first wrote that those who break a tradition first hold it in awe. There's no need to leap into an unknown future to find a break. A black study shows us that oftentimes it's the return to ourselves, most of all, that is the break. That is what it means to be an intellectual forged in and of black study. And he makes this very clear writing on the very first page of the book, the following, quote, we were told that we had to be inside or else. And now that we are here, they lie to us. He continues, they lied about us, about why we are here, how we got here and what it means to be here. Although they would eventually shut the gates, some of us made it through and have been here for a long time now, which means we have listened to these lines, these lies for a long time now. The lies have changed, but they are still lies. Every now and then there's a slip, an exposure, the seam opens. A black study is a remembering of that tradition through the lens and lives of four black intellectuals who question the lie at its most very uh, fundamental core, the very meaning of knowledge, end quote. When Sylvia Winter wrote in her interview on Proud, Proud Flesh that, quote, you see, it's not just an intellectual struggle. You could call it a psychointellectual struggle. Then you could understand why in the 60s, it wasn't just a call for black studies, it was a call for black aesthetics, it was a call for black arts, it was a call for black power. She continues writing that for black studies, quote, the great battle now is going to be against the truth, end quote. And she punctuates this point saying that what we need is a war against consciousness. A black study is, in my estimation, loading the gun for such a confrontation. The question is, Will we answer the call put forth by Winter, put forth by a Black study? Will we pull the trigger? I want to end my opening by offering a section from Josh's poem. Yes, he's also a poet and a musician too. <laughs> At the conclusion of the book. And this is on page 191. What we are trying to say is that we know what it is to be against and even what it is to be for. Still, this space was consecrated by the ancestors, by a living tradition who gave so much that we could imagine what it is to be of each other, to be of, of our worlds, to be of a practice of study, to be of Black study. And with that said, thank you all for coming here and I hope you enjoy the rest of this afternoon's discussion. And thank you again to Josh for this invitation. And so now, now we can get to the good bits. All right, so I'll go easy on you with the first question. So, so when did this project start? So I think most folks don't, probably don't know that this project began a long, long time ago. It's gone through many iterations. You published other things while still working on this. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of this project? and? First of all, how are y'all doing? I feel like I'm talking to two different channels. But, um, how's everybody doing? Thank you all for being here. And you know, you surprised me too. I didn't know you had written something. And I should have known that you would write something because that's what you do. Um, where's the feedback coming from? No worries. All right. All right, how do we sound? All right, beautiful. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, we're in Sankofa now, and that means a lot um, to me. And in many respects, you know, Sankofa is one of the sites where this kind of work is possible, made possible in ways that are not possible in other types of places. Um, and so when you asked that question, I kind of thought about the Sankofa origins of this, of, this, of this work. And I can just recall as an undergraduate at Howard University, walking over to the space and there was always something akin to black study happening. I couldn't name it though. And, and I didn't know how to situate it within the genealogy, right? I couldn't understand why, and I don't know if Abba Tariq is here, 
I couldn't understand why Baba Tariq would insist on taking us through the history of the UNIA and not letting us leave until we could recite certain facts back to him. Some of y'all have experienced that, right? I couldn't fully understand why when I, one time I came here and, and Baba Haile Garima said that you can't talk about Pan-Africanism until you read Elmacar Cabral. And I didn't know who Cabral was, right? And so part of what I call the gestation of this work is in being in these kinds of spaces because I didn't get, unfortunately, I didn't get the UNIA genealogy in my undergraduate education. I didn't get the idea that Cabral was necessary to many of these conversations in my undergraduate education. That was what the undercommons was responsible for. And so I wanted in part um, to write about how, you know, those types of interactions and engagements in literally physical spaces are reproduce produce the possibilities for having black studies in the academy in the first place. And if we have inherited something different from that, then we're not doing black studies. What have we inherited? And how do we respond and how are we responsible to that inheritance? To me, it has a lot to do with what happens here. Um, literally every day, what happens in these spaces um, every day. So we must hold these spaces dear. Uh, we must work to preserve these spaces in all the ways that we can. Because I don't know who I would have been had it not been for a space like Sankofa. Um, you can clap right there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that genealogy, Sankofa, you know, Africana Studies at Howard University, um, at the time was almost singularly um, inspired, moved by the work of Greg Carr, um, who arrived at um, Howard University in the year 2000. Um, didn't really have no help. Um, and some of y'all experienced those years. Um, and how that felt to sort of engage Black studies as a discipline. Very explicitly, Black studies as a discipline. And for those who, um, you know, some of my students, you know how serious I am about that idea, right? Black studies is its own thing. And wanting to think about how Black studies being its own thing and also um, recognize the responsibilities that we have to spaces like Sankofa in our community. How do those two things work together? How does intellectual autonomy work together with the self-determination of our communities, right? Those conversations sort of congealed to determine the nature of my graduate school work, which then became, of course, you know, the driver's license that you have to get to graduate, which is your dissertation, <laughs> right? The dissertation then became another type of project uh, when I realized that I did not want to make my dissertation the response to the, the, the reply to the community that made me. And it was a necessary kind of reckoning, right? Because the form and function of a dissertation is different from the form and function of a testimony to your community. And so this form had to change. And that's why the book takes the form that it does, even though many of the same conversations are in my dissertation. And I also realized that through teaching that my students perk up the most when I tell life stories. Right, so the stories of people's lives, the stories of people's journey, the stories of how certain intellectuals come to the conclusions that they come. And so I used the, that form to engage the conversation that I was having around what well, Black Studies has to be its own thing. And so who are the people that most resonate when it comes to helping us get to that point? And that sort of got me to the, the uh, six people that we talk about in the text. Um, and so, for those who may be like, well, how long did this take? Um, this entire process, I mean, if you count the years, it probably took about 12 years to come into existence uh, from conception to, to this text and several changes. Um, there are probably four different forms that this has taken. And then once I finally decided on form, um, you know, 
that's when you you all come in. And, you know, I was telling the panel, we had a panel about the book on Thursday at Howard. And I was telling the panel, you were the first person that I didn't have to explain not only the form, but also the argument, right? You were like, oh, yeah, <laughs> right? In the way that you do. And I knew, I knew it wasn't a kind of, you know, some people say that when they don't read stuff, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, I get it. No, it wasn't that. It was, oh, I get it. And not having to explain, right, in the sense of, we often talk about it, you shouldn't have to explain your humanity to other people, right? In some ways, I had to explain why it was necessary for Black Studies to make its own claim on knowledge, its own claim on reality, its own claim on who African people are. I shouldn't have to explain that to a publisher. And I didn't have to explain that to you. And that's when the form kind of took off. And so the form that this takes, intellectual biography and in many other kinds of different ways of intervening within the text, but primarily intellectual biography, uh, became a way for me to really talk about something much deeper, and that is how do we ensure that we maintain this idea that Black Studies is its own thing in the world, and that is literally connected to the communities of struggle, right, that are all across our communities, the larger diaspora, the continent in relation to the diaspora, right? But in a way that then opens up the possibility of us doing this with more and more and more and more and more examples. This isn't a, a closed text, it's an opening. I want it to be an opening for us to renew that, that spirit um, of self-determination, of the idea um, of Black Studies declaring a space and preserving that space. Um, and so it's a, long, it's a long journey because that's not as easy as saying, well, Black Studies exists. Let's go into archives and let's find evidence of its existence and then just report, right? That's what Black, that, mm, this is being recorded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the Black Studies historiography that exists now does. Let's report on what happened. All right, let's, all right, let's, let's. This is a living tradition though, right? And so the archives held, and I went to the archives with this text but I also tried to tap into what makes us who we are, right? So I gotta talk about Sylvia Winter and dance and John, John Canoe and things. And I have to talk about like all of the things, the things that, you know, she said, I'm a musician. I'm not quite a musician, I'm becoming one. <laughs> but there's a moment when you're learning a thing and you experience a connection to the thing that makes, that animates, that, you know, gives you life, right? It's the way I explain it, because that's like the colloquial term, or it was the colloquial term for many of my students, right? Black studies gives you life. And if it's not giving you life, you're not doing black studies. You're doing something else. And you should feel it, right? Kelly Miller talked about, you know, there's this Howard spirit, right? Only those that feel it know. Well, this is black study spirit. Those that feel it know. And so my litmus test, if you will, is not whether or not you know, this passes the muster of you know, folks who are looking for, what's your contribution to knowledge? And, so, and that's, how doing, that's how people are going to write about it in like reviews and stuff. That's very cute. I'm not talking to y'all. <laughs> my litmus test is not only people in this room, but also, did you feel it? See? <laughs> Jai has had a copy for like a, two weeks now, so. But did you feel it? And if you can feel it, then you can do the work. What's the word? Liberation. Ain't contribution to knowledge. That's what, you know, that's what disciplines do. And have do it, right? <laughs> I hope that answers. <laughs> yes, uh, it sure does. Uh, but what you were saying, it actually recalls for me, you know, this like persistent, like almost like frustration that sometimes is produced from ins inside like the institutional spaces of black studies, which is like, we're a discipline too, right? And saying that it's its own thing is not the same as saying we are also a discipline. 
because the idea, right? I mean, and this is one thing that we've talked about before, but, you know, one thing that people, they leave out of or Sylvia's um, argument and how we mistook the map of the territory. She says, yes, Black studies was debanged by institutionalization, but also by giving in to the seductions of discipline. Yes. Right? By actually wanting to decorate itself with the accoutrements of discipline and disciplinarity, right, in order to be in this institutional space. And so saying it's its own thing is not the same as saying we are also a discipline, right? Because as you said, the idea, and you know, and she says that she was doing the work of Black Studies on Jamaica Journal before she ever arrived in the United States. And then when she got to the United States, she was simply carrying out the work of the Jamaica Journal anyway. Because to her, that was Black studies. That's what it meant to her was, as she said it, right? Telling stories about who we are as Black people and about who we are as Africans. Because in the end, that's a radicalism that is entirely immersive. And it's not the cheap and easy radicalism of the institution, be it the state, be it the university, what have you. So I feel like that's something that just comes out so crystal clear in, yeah. in, in the book. Yeah. Do you yeah. So, like, disciplinarity is, like, really the entree point for me into the conversation because we're struggling for institutional space only because institutional space gives us access to students, which then gives us access to the communities that they represent, right? Which is why this room is full, because I have students who come here because there's a different kind of conversation. And then they meet folks that are not associated with the university, and then they can have a different kind of conversation, right? And so, but in that struggle of institutional space, the problem becomes, well, you have to legitimize why you can be here, right? And we actually had this conversation at the tail end Thursday, and we really couldn't get into it, so we all, we're all aligned. Um, and one of the things I said on Thursday is that the difference in many respects between um, Black Studies' quest to create something like a PhD program in Black Studies was really to have us start the conversation in a different place, right? What do I mean by that? Too often, Black Studies departments were populated by folks who were struggling against white disciplines, right? Which is what we have to do <laughs> if we're gonna be in the university. If we're not doing that, what are we doing, right? But Black Studies, by creating a PhD um, within the discipline of black studies, what if we started from not struggling against whiteness? Some people who are non black studies can't even imagine that question. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what do you mean? My whole existence is in relationship to the white historian that I'm writing against. And I think these, particularly Cedric Sylvia, and Jacob Carruthers, Cesar Robinson, Sylvia Winter, Jacob Carruthers, who are, represent three of the chapters in the book, they were moving to a place where we're not gonna start from that. We're gonna start from displacing whiteness, right? And we're not gonna devote our whole intellectual careers to the project of displacing whiteness. But we're not gonna start from the assumption that our whole Black Studies practice is White supremacy exists. Oh my God, this is horrible. But the, but the move, right, is to displace that without ignoring it. Because the, the, the conservative side is, right, don't talk about it without, because it, we're, we're moving past it, right? It doesn't exist. No, you displace it without ignoring it. And then you come to a particular point in your intellectual work where all right, what else is there? What other possibilities exist when you displace this conversation? And so Black Studies PhDs are supposed to be, right, being trained to start from there rather than start from, oh my God, there are no Black people in this movie. <laughs> we need more representation. Okay. <laughs> Just not Black Studies. And y'all who took take Black Studies note, right? And so what we have done, unfortunately, is that the people who know that this point of departure is in this tradition of not, you know, 
as, as Carl writes, mediating upon whiteness in relationship, or mediating upon blackness in relationship to whiteness. We don't hire them in black studies programs anymore. And this is something that if you're not in it, you don't know, right? <laughs> But Dora and I teach in black studies, we are both black studies PhDs and we teach in black studies programs. But in many cases, our departments are populated by folk who don't start in this tradition anymore. And so part of what this book is trying to do is say, you gonna be in a black studies department, then there gotta be some breaks made. Or go back, or go back to your real home, all right? And I think, that's really one of the animating like, reasons for this. And I think it's not just to say it in a polemical way, but it's also to say, well, Cedric Robinson model how to do it. Right? They don't resolve it, because if they had resolved it, we would be closer, much closer to liberation than we are, right? But they say, as long as we are in these institutional spaces, this has to be our relationship to them. Otherwise, go back to political science and just have a nice career. And nobody will, you know, some people, I will, but most people won't say, I have anything to say, negative to say if you do that, right? <laughs> it's very nice. You can get, you know, do, do very well as our former chair, uh, Russell Adams, who was the chair for decades on the Department of African Studies at Howard, as he would say, right? You can do good by doing well. And that's another part about this book is the sacrifice every one of them made right and it's not that they were poor but it's not also not that they become the quote-unquote stars in fact they're stars now in elderhood or in ancestry right can you imagine doing your work for so long and then at the end of your end of your life people elevate you to the start saying where were y'all did you read it oh, maybe we it to that are they actually reading it <laughs> well, you know, that was going to be my next question is the reason why the disciplinary space of Black Studies and its relationship to all the other disciplines is so effective, right, at constraining, you know, these ideas or writings or utterances that might actually break open some of our core assumptions, not only conceptually, about, but also about who we are, not only here, but everywhere. Um, Part of the difficulty is that there are costs to that. Everything has its price, everything, right? And these are people who paid that price, not only in terms of their intellectual community, but like materially, right? So Du Bois having to leave the academy altogether in order to do the work he wants to do. And, you know, uh, Sylvia Winter never got tenure, right? Because Black Metamorphosis, her, her one monograph, was not published, right? And she refused to change it. And so she never got tenure. So to this day, she's 93 years old, she does not have tenure, right? Cedric Robinson having to sue his department, right? In order to get his dissertation, um, you know, approved and also constantly fighting these institutional battles. I mean- Also did get tenure at his first position. He also did not receive tenure at his first position. And, you know, Carruthers, right, I mean, doing a critique of justice, of like normative conceptions of justice, and like in political theory, you might as well just hang it up, right? Nobody's, nobody's going to, you know, read you, cite you, right? And then, but not just them, but the two people that you choose to bookend the book, right? Tony K. Bambara, she writes, leaves. she leaves, right? And she writes in her memoir how people were telling her you're committing career suicide, right? And then she also writes that, you know, how am I supposed to write without a community? I can only write if I have a community, right? And so they paid the price for their, they lived by their ideas. And that is part of the difficulty is that when you now begin to make these possessive claims and develop these possessive attachments, the idea that we too are a discipline, well, then you have to function as disciplines do, right? If that's the case. And all of these people refuse to do that. And so um, that was like a long way where the little ramp, but there is a question, right? And so there is, in each of these chapters, I think, uh, 
what's being said and also like a hidden transcript, almost. Mm -hmm. So with Du Bois and the critique of, you know, kind of normative sociology or what have you, the hidden transcript is the hesitation, right? So the hesitation, the idea that it, nothing is ever complete, you know, the attempts to dominate us are never complete as well, right? But also the work itself is never complete. It Carruthers, this idea of divine speech, all I could hear while I was reading it was George Landing's idea of this occasion for speaking, you know? And in that chapter as well, the emphasis on orality, all I could also hear was Sylvia riffing on Landing the idea that the language that the enslaved carried over in the transplantation process was the language of the drum. Yes. Because the paraphernalia of literacy was not required for the kind of knowledge they were carrying over. And the, the critique of authority, the idea is that it's not just political science that has a possessive attachment to authority. Certain black intellectual traditions also have a possessive attachment to authority. And so each of these chapters is what's being said and what's being said like more kind of subtly. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, I think part of it is because you're a musician. So to me, it reads as though there's like a top line and a, and a yeah. bass line. But can you yeah. talk about how you wove that in there so beautifully? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so if you look at the table of contents um, for the book, uh, what Badur was referring to are the kind of, the word that appears after the word of. And um, I want to go back to that disciplinary thing too. So remind me, yeah. <laughs> but I think it starts from my work on Cedric Robinson. Um, that was the chapter that came first. And one of the things that I noticed, and also in terms of for those who maybe maybe want to know about the trajectory um, of the books. I wrote the chapter in of Black Study on Cedric Robinson before I wrote my book on Cedric Robinson. So this came first in many respects. Um, I wanted to know why terms of order hadn't been read alongside Black Marxism. Most people, when you're reading a scholar, right? you read their books as having a relationship to each other, to, right? But there is this over, can I use the word overemphasis on black Marxism? Elizabeth would say a non-reading overemphasis. <laughs> you, you only cite it, but you don't read it. We were at the, um, we were at UT Austin. She said, I wish I could just burn it. <laughs> and we were like, well, we also have, yeah, I understand why, because, you know, it's, a, it's frustrating. Um, the constant citation without real engagement. But I was thinking about why Terms of Order was not read alongside by Marxism. I don't know if anyone's here that took my first seminar on Cedric Robinson back in 2016. Um, we read, it in, we, read, we read the books in order. And the act made it clear. You have to, I mean, and I had never read it and read them in tandem myself, right? But I knew they had to be understood together. But in teaching them, I had to read them in sequence. And then it was like, I gotta write this. The word order is in the title of terms of order, but it is shot through within our conception of racial capitalism. Right? The way that he talks about the emergence of race, that's order. The way that he talks about religion in Black Marxism, right? that's order. Right? And I wanted us to sort of understand that it is not just that the Black radical tradition is responding to capitalism or racism or any of the moments of oppression that we've so eloquently have been given the word ma'afa, right? The great disaster, right? Black, the black radical tradition is the response to order, right? It's called into existence because order is there. 
And so I wanted to really think about order and how it appears in the discipline of political science and then how it appears to Cedric Robinson in the ways that he frames, not just, you know, like I said, the thing that we got to displace, but also how we do the displacing and what comes after the displacement. And so that got me to thinking, right? Well, what term or what word or what concept can we use to mark that moment in these other scholars? And it took me back to Sociology Hesitant by W.E.B. Du Bois, right? Hesitance as an orientation to the whole thing, right? But, I, but not just, you know, however we frame, again, the problem, but also to the order of knowledge that allows us to even define the problem hesitant toward it, right? And then with winter, of course, is what philosophy or what way of knowing allows the West to even say that it knows what it knows, right? It's the over-representation of man as human. And so what is a human? How do we think about that, right? Because everything in the West hinges on how you answer that question. What is or who is human? And that goes further than just, you know, the creation of race or the creation of gender, right? It precedes those things, as Winter so um, beautifully shows us through our work. And then finally, um, speech uh, with Jacob Carruthers becomes the one thing that animates Black existence, literally, wherever we are. And if we can understand, if we could just understand that, right? <laughs> we can understand a lot, right? I do this exercise, you know, with my students all the time because we start our, I start my black thought courses with this 19th or 20th century with Jacob the Brothers. And one of the things that we do is says, who believes that we, you can actually speak something into existence? Who in here believes that you can speak something into existence? Why do you believe that? You've seen it before, right? You experience, or somebody told you that you can't. <laughs> That's knowledge, right? In other words, Jacob Brothers will say that's African deep thought. And to the people that raise their hands, have you studied the ways in which Africans across time and space have thought about the concept of speech? No. no. But you know that. You know that you can speak something into existence. And so there's a relationship then between study and living in living, a relationship between study and existence that is shot through this concept of speech. And what Carruthers is saying, now that we, not only that we know that speech is important, now let's connect it across time and space. Because underneath speech is a whole nother way of living and being that we can use in our struggle. So that's his response to political science. Yeah, and it also, like, reminds me of, so I didn't know this until I listened to an interview that Josh did recently, but he and I both read A Sociology Hesitant for the first time in the same year, 2011. So no wonder we're here together where we are all these years later. But I remember what stood out to me most about reading that, that essay was that the idea was that the hesitation was gesturing towards um, instability, like this radical instability that's constantly um, present with us and to not try to resolve the instability, but to dwell in it because that instability is what produces these um, impulses towards trying to think something else. Um, but what also stood out to me in the essay was this idea that the hesitation is brought about by approaching the limit of a particular frame. And the idea is that you approach the limit and it's daunting. And so you hesitate, but then you go, you move across. And it's not, not the technical training you have as an academic that lets you do that. It's who you are. He says, it's who I am, right? As a, a Black person that allows me to do, and this is something that all four of them did. I mean, Sylvia, her whole her artist, playwright, novelist, critic, professor, essayist, everything, dancer. The idea is that you approach the limit of the, you hesitate for a moment and then you go. And the idea is 
when that limit appears, we have to act. Right. We have to do something. And they all chose to do something. And what's beautiful is that that's not just apparent in this idea of the Du Bois and hesitation. It's also apparent in, you know, Robinson's decision to open, right, with a, a meditation on m maroons, right? Encountering indigenous people in the Americas, right? right. And what they did was they moved. And then, you know, and, and winter, this idea that black people, even on the continent of Africa, were people who had always kept their traveling shoes nearby. And so if there's anything that makes us who we are, black people, if we can point to one thing, it's this thing, right? Of always keeping our traveling shoes nearby. It's in this restlessness that you indicated with your understanding, you know, I, I think you did an interview, you mentioned Ronald Judy's. Yes. Or this idea, right, of the parasimiosis, this restlessness. So it's there's a way that each thing that each of them is, you know, trying to move against is appearing in one another's work. Like it's this, right. it's like this cosmogram, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That you've... Mm -hmm. That's the cover, you know. The cosmogram. The cosmogram. Exactly. And I noticed that, like, immediately from reading just, like, the perspectives. And so how incredible, I mean, to just be able to weave that and how the content and the form... Right, because the way you've written it is like a cosmogram, and then the, the the content of it has all of these meeting places where the four of them meet again and again right. at this crossroads. And I just I just wanted to like hats off to you, and you can applaud the pen that is required in order to do that. Um, I have a real question now. <laughs> so, why this series? Aside from the fact that we're friends, yeah. why, I mean, and I also will say, like, it's no, sending in a book with this much stuff on winter to, I mean, me, okay, yeah, but Anthony Bogues, right? <laughs> Not easy. And Same courageous. Same why don't you say it? That's your professor. So, Enjoy Anthony Bogues, uh, you know, also trained in political theory, was... Uh, steeped in many, many kind of radical movements in Jamaica for most of his adult life, became an academic after that. And long story short, he was my PhD advisor at Brown. He introduced me to Sylvia Winter's ideas and he um, brought me on as part of the team that was archiving all of her papers and uh, working to edit her one monograph, Black Metamorphosis, to manuscript format for publication. So he's like the guy. <laughs> you know, when it comes to, and so Josh sending his book to a series edited by the both of us, like I said, me aside, but to Anthony, but with this much winter in it is very courageous and brave. So you're better than me because I would have been scared. <laughs> but in, yeah, so talk, why don't you tell, because I don't know actually, so why? Yeah. yeah. I think it was, it's part of the answer that I gave earlier. You know, you all immediately understood um, what was happening in ways that didn't require me to explain, you know, explain what I shouldn't have to explain to the people who know what Black Studies is, right? Um, but beyond that, I think what the, what this series is doing, and we talked about this on Thursday, right? I mean, if you look on the Black Critique Series website, look at the names of the people who are being elevated in the way that they are being elevated the moments that are being elevated. Um, was the book on uh, the Writers' Conference first or second? Uh, third, actually. Third, yeah. okay. So it was the... Um, Tom Sankara. Sankara, and then... Black Red Caribbean. Black Red Caribbean. And then... And then yeah. If you just take that one moment, and I don't know if many people are aware of this, um, C.L.I. James is there, and James is approached by Jimmy Garrett. Do y'all know Jimmy Garrett? No. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Garrett is still among the living, still active. Um, but Jimmy Garrett at the time is here in D.C. and it was at that mo at that conference, among the other things that happened in the moment, but I just want to tie this up. 
is at that conference where Jimmy Grant Garrett approaches C.R.L.I. James and coaxes him to come here to D.C. And when James comes to D.C., James brings a certain kind of energy um, to the radical movements that are happening in this city in 1970, 1971, 1972. Um, and it has, it almost has this magnetic, he almost has this magnetic effect on not only um, the young, younger activists, primarily Pan-Africanists who are then organizing the Sixth Pan-African Congress. Um, DC is really central to that story. But it also has a really important effect on Black studies at both Federal City College, where he was asked to teach, now UDC, and at Howard. And if you polled our administration and our faculty about the do you know who Sarah James is? Do you know he's out of Howard? I'm sh I would be shocked if more than 2% of us know that. But when you go into the archives, what we find, he's bringing Sylvia Winter to campus. I think the only time Sylvia Winter ever comes to campus was because of C.R.L.R. James. And Carol Davis was in the class. And Carol Boyce Davis is in that classroom, so is John McClendon, I think. Yeah. I mean, these. And she writes the first meditation on her creative work masquerade and then you know publishes so you can see how just like being in these classes yeah. and so all of this is connected but guess what you can learn about this in the black critique series <laughs> <laughs> there is no other black studies series at any other press that's talking about these stories that are you know it's the it's, it's those if you know you know type stories right and so it's like a one-stop shop and i can just do this with many of the other books right um we were talking about the point to change the points to change the world the other day in my class, right? Nobody is talking about the way that you know why. <laughs> I mean, I, I know now. I mean, you brought up the. I mean, what's so interesting about the Congress is you know it was organized well by Bobby Hill. Bobby Hill's still with us, right? And pretty much like everything we know about Garvey, like all, you know, we owe a lot to Bobby Hill for that. But he so was one of the organizers as a student, and it was after that con conference, right, that. Walter Rodney was then banned upon his return to Jamaica, right? right. Banned not for, as people might think, you know, um, associating with Rastafari, who's actually banned for teaching African history, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. um, I also think that having that book in the series is is important because of all the other kind They're of historical the yeah. ricochets historically that yeah. produced that moment. But thank you for saying and that. Also, and also, yeah. This is because you brought, I mean, the writing piece is why people, why most people know about that conference, right? Um, but just in 68, 69, through 68, 1968 to 1972, there are a number of similar conferences, right? And because Walter Rodney spoke at that conference, obviously there are places like, okay, he's banned from going back to, so let's bring him here. And everybody's like fighting over, like, and so Howard kind of loses that fight. Because there were some people that wanted him to come to Howard, but guess what? Howard University Press Publishing first publishes the U.S. edition of How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It's out of that moment. Um, Vincent Harding writes. <laughs> Vincent Harding writes the introduction. Forward. Um, you can do Vincent Harding connections too, right? <laughs> um, but the other part, what's it going to say? Rodney, we didn't get Rodney on the faculty, but Rodney, because of people like Ethelbert Miller, his sister, uh, Kathleen Rodney, so many different forces, right? He does give a series of lectures on campus. Um, I think it's 1973 or four. Uh, we invite him to give, I think, three different lectures, a series of lectures. And you can kind of see like where Rodney is heading in that particular moment. Um, so I just wanted to say that, like our archives, just here in, at Howard, uh, can tell a lot of the stories that are then amplified in many of the books that are in the Black Critique series. Well, thanks for that. And um, yes, please check out the Black Critique series on Pluto Press. You can find all of those books available, including Josh's book. And we also have another new release, which is Brian Meek's um, Post-Colonial Caribbean. Now, what's after that? I don't know. I can't. Sh I cannot. I don't recall at this moment. Okay. Uh, that's. Okay. We can talk about that later. Okay.
Um, <laughs> and so this will be like my last uh, prompt, and All then right. we can, you know, talk about this prompt a little bit, and then open it up to um, uh, the community here to give some thoughts and questions. Um, I guess what stood out to me most about the, I mean, a lot of things stood out to me about the book, but what stood out to me most about the book is the way that there is this beautifully kind of choreographed dance between the chapters, even though they're treated kind of like standalone kind of considerations of these individual uh, concepts. But could you talk a little bit about how each of these thinkers were specifically um, moving kind of differently inside of these institutions yes. pedagogically, yeah. right, in terms of their teaching. So I know that the example I know best is, is, is Sylvia, mm -hmm. having seen her papers and how dozens and dozens of boxes of course readers where the table of contents were being written and rewritten, trying to figure out, it literally in that moment, like she's trying to, like, what is Black Studies? And in that moment, as she's like teaching, is also kind of trying to develop uh, a pedagogical, you know, and she also wrote a book on pedagogy, do not call us Negroes, right? Like a lot of people don't know that like, if you read her works carefully, there's a huge engagement with Cardi Woodson, right? Who she admires deeply um, in her work. Obviously, Cedric Robinson proposing courses that were so different. You can see in his papers, all the different course readers and course proposals, and also the minutes from meetings where he was fighting all of the, so could you talk a little bit about their uh, pedagogy, how they approach teaching and how that related to their work in black studies and all of that? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I think you know, this allows me to go back to the point around like how do, how do we maneuver this question of disciplinarity differently in black studies? And I think it's not gonna come through this orientation around research, which is so hardened into the harmful parts about the academy, right? I mean, think about the research enterprise, right? All the things that we do in fulfilling that agenda that harm us, that becomes the basis for those tenure decisions in many re respects, right? That becomes the basis for a lot of the gatekeeping. That becomes the basis for the disciplining of thought, right? But what's the most undisciplined place, at least for now, in the academy? The classroom. For now, nobody comes into our classrooms and tells us what we can't do. For now. Right? And so that's where black studies might need might need to hang its hat. It's in pedagogy. And that's not to say that research is unimportant, it's to say that a lot of what these scholars were doing was writing for their teaching. And, you know, I teach, how many people do I teach? I teach like 200 something students. And 200 or something students are not gonna read up Black Study. And so I have them in the classroom and that becomes a way to do, a black, to do black study, right? And so we hope that they would eventually get to a point where, oh, I, I should probably read this too, right? But we can actually do the real work in the classroom. And I think um, writing for that purpose is really instructive, right? Um, I'll just use Cedric Robinson as an example since you already talked about winter. Robinson, was one of the most effective classroom lecturers, right? You hear me use the word, I'm a teacher a lot, right? Because I don't read from a script. Um, you know, I improvise. Sometimes I walk around the room and, you know, do that kind of stuff. Um, you know, play music. And I'll do all kinds of stuff that, you know, if this was 17th century Germany, I would be banned, right? <laughs> because the idea of a lecture comes from 17th century Germany. And it's, you get in front of the lectern, which is your prepared document, and you read for 80% of the session. Other 20% is the students asking you to repeat what you read. <laughs> All right? And maybe ask questions. But usually, because the text is such an authority in Western thought, you can't question. 
right? Unless you get a PhD, that's the question. And so that's what, and that's where the idea of the research seminar comes from. And that's where the idea of, you know, creating original research, but then what we would call undergraduate education, there's no question. You have the authority to question, right? You learn the text based on me reading it and you take notes exactly as I read it, right? And so when I say Cedric Robinson was one of the most effective lecturers, he actually lectured, meaning he read. But it was effective in the sense that what he was reading was not an attempt to discipline you, but to open new vistas in your thinking. I haven't mastered how to do that yet, right? If I go in class and start reading, I'm like, okay, what are you doing? But the reason that it was so effective is because there's something about the word and about speech and about writing as an invitation, as opposed to writing as here is the received knowledge that you must have in order to pass this exam. Guess what the lectures became? The books that he wrote. And so when you read a Cedric Robinson book, particularly, I'll just say the Pacific text, Black Movements in America, which becomes, becomes one of the books we use in the intro here at Howard, right? Or there at Howard. <laughs> and, and, and Anthropology of Marxism. These are literally lecture notes. And so he's taken what is a pedagogical practice that was extremely effective. Because I talked to people that took the classes and I was like, that wasn't boring for him to just read. It's not like, no, because it was how he wrote. And why he wrote. And so you're reading his classroom practice as much as you're reading scholarship. And to me, that's where we can hang our hats. He was telling a story. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. there you go. I remember when I first started teaching and I asked um, I asked Sylvia for advice. So I said, I'm really nervous. Like what how what's gonna be my thing? How am I gonna do it? And she said to me Stop. every they time don't know that you know Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean it's a slip, so one would have to meet the person that <laughs> they're working on papers and such. So yeah. that point aside. Um, but she told me every time you go into the classroom, you make sure you tell a story. Make sure you're telling a story. You're not transmitting knowledge, but you are telling a story. What story am I going to tell today? Is what she said to me. And then I noticed in Cedric Robinson's works that that was the case. You know, Kemal Bathwaite's History of the Voice, that was a lecture that was given. And in the, in the book version, you see him saying, and the student yesterday said, is it language that makes revolutions? And I said, no, it's people that makes revolutions. Well, like the most quoted lines from the book, and it was a response to a student question, right? Um, and there is something about learning with our students, right? Disrupting this, right? Hierarchy. Assumed, and not just the hierarchy, but the, uh, the, the purity of each position, as it were, of educator and student, what have you. Um, and so the idea is that all of these people are trying to tell a different story, you know, about who we are. Stories are, you know, Sadia Harmon says in, in Venus in Two Acts, she says, you know, repair is to her an impossibility, but the closest thing we have is the transmission of stories. Yeah. That's the closest thing we actually have to something like repair, and right. repair is impossible. Um, so wow. thank you. Should we stop? We're, we're going to open it up to <laughs> everyone. Please, is there a microphone that's going to go around? Should, or you will just raise your voice so that folks on the live stream can hear. Or we, or we'll repeat the or we can repeat the questions. You can. I want to so much thank you guys. I received the second Black Studies certificate degree from the University of Houston in 1972. You all have elevated the dream that we had when we started Black Studies Program. And I always make I always make a point of saying that the University of Houston program was a Black Studies program. It was an African after American Studies program, which allowed us to study not only history. Me, me, and Mike. 
<laughs> this is what I do for a living. <laughs> run my mouth. Shut up, Tom. <laughs> my name is Thomas Atlanta. I graduated from the University of Houston African American Studies Program in 1972. I congratulate you all for taking what we started at my wife graduated from Howard. <laughs> and making it the path, the, the journey. You know, people worried about us getting caught in the academia. Don't worry. You are humans. You and you make an old man proud. <laughs> Brother Thomas is a great example of what you can do with African American studies. So if anyone has ever or still has had that question, go talk to Brother Thomas. See what he's done with African American studies. Because trust me, I don't know anybody with an African American studies degree that's not doing anything. Right? So I hate that question. <laughs> Any other questions? Can we get a mic runner? I got a question. I think there's one in the back one before in you. The back. Can we get the microphone? Can oh. it pull the reach? Or we need a mic runner. Wow. Can that be you, Eric? Uh, no. Possibly. Can I ask my question? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, think somebody's before you. Could you. Could grab like my uh, my question is in general for the future of black studies or African American studies, African American studies, African studies. Um, how do we increase the percentage of students that are engaging with uh, black studies to be uh, more read about uh, outside of the Americanist perspective? Uh, I say that just because uh, in traveling different uh, different universities in the states, I find that there's no mandate, for example, in some programs that students learn an African language in addition to whatever other language that they have and that there's no mandate before graduating to to have step foot on the continent to contextualize uh, the root of all of this that brings us together within some type of ethnic or cultural perspective. Go ahead and answer this, Eric. You can ask yours and then we'll oh. yeah. Um, yeah, I was, when you were talking about spaces um, and in particular shouting out uh, Sankofa, I was just wondering at, if for people that are interested in um, those conversations that we should all know, but sometimes are difficult to access, what are some groups, you know, I'm thinking of ASCAC, for example, but what are some, what are some groups or formations that sort of gesture toward genealogy um, that you would, that the two of you could suggest to people both locally and that might be on the, uh, viewing on the live stream. So neither of us are Americanists. I don't know. Not even American. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from this country. <laughs> so it's hard to answer that question because we all teach from, you know, an African standpoint. My language requirement at Temple was an African language. Um, we teach African languages in the African American Studies Department at Howard. We go to Africa in the African American Studies and, and uh, to the West Indies Um And so it's kind of, you know, our students are now saying we need more classes, but in terms of like the orientation and frame, um, it's where Afri wherever you find African people, or Africa when, when and whatever you, wherever you find it, right? Um, which is also very extremely hard to do, which is why we also can't be baked into the discipline, disciplinarity, which is only requires you to focus on what one, ge one geographic region, one time, one time space, one time frame, right? And so, um, I think the challenge is for um, us to then spread that perspective, um, right from that perspective. Um, 
And so if you look at some of the folks who are in, um, in my book, they all wrote from that perspective. Um, in terms of Africa itself, I think there's an Africa portion on each in each chapter. <laughs> um, in terms of how each engage uh, Africa, and I think you know W. E. B. Du Bois, who, by the way, you know, is only able to do this because he's reading William Leo Hansberry, whose daughter, whose um, daughter Gail is here with us today. William Leo Hansberry didn't have many much many resources, but he had this deep interest, right, in studying the African continent and what it means for us, right? And so we look at the, the uh, I think it's the preface maybe, or forward to the world in Africa by W.E.B. Du Bois, it is Hansberry who he says, right? A lot of this work relies on. And so I have a section of the Du Bois chapter called Africa to Du Bois, where basically I argue that after the hesitance, there is Africa, All right? And so Du Bois starts thinking alongside like what Africa means to him, right? Riffing on his ex, <laughs> his ex son-in-law, <laughs> County Cullen, right? But it's there. I think it's there for Winter. It's there for Carruthers in a big way. For Carruthers, it's there for for Robinson. After the order. There's the Ilatanga peoples, right? And so, this is inescapable. We can't be we can't be Americanists and do black studies. Not this kind of black studies. Yeah, and as someone who's not American, right? Uh, you know, my black studies uh, journey, the United States is the last stop on my journey, starting in Toronto, then going to the UK, and then finding my way to the United States, but. And, you know, in my, my department at Brown, not only, you know, are we learning other languages, but the faculty there have right. taught in on the African continent themselves and are, you know, deeply committed uh, to that. And I also think there's only so much the institution can do because I think, as Josh mentioned, so many of these thinkers we're not thinking from inside of the US context only. And so the idea is that, yes, we're here in the United States, people might not be able to move around a lot, but we can offer a kind of approach to this education so that if they were to find themselves on the continent, what are they gonna do, right? <laughs> um, and I think that's the thing that's that's important. And the, you know, I mean, the centrality of the African continent for Sylvia Winter is something that I think is oftentimes alighted in her work. And, you know, she is, you know, in Black Metamorphosis, this idea of the middle passage reversed. And um, she's still very much a Garveyite in that way. You know, she believes in this idea of return. And return is not just physical, right? But in the idea of return. And after authority, there's the ill tongue people. After the human, I mean, after man, right, there's the human. And where is that? She says you can find it, right, in Palombo's cave, right, in the southern regions of, of Africa, you can find. And also, as a practical matter, her papers, she initially had wanted them archived at an African university. But because they didn't have the facilities or the funds to do it, it didn't end up happening. But there's, I think, Asking where does Africa fit, I think it presupposes that Africa isn't always already there for these people. And so if we can call our attention to these people, then the call is answered in the moment that it's offered because of who they are and how they were thinking. Is that right? Would you say yeah. that's yeah. kind of cool? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah, there's study groups all over the places. And I think Harold is asking for other people's benefits more than his. <laughs> and so um, if you're a Howard student, you know, there are like three or four study groups that you can join. Um, KTS, Kwame Tori Society. Um, I think there's now a Black Feminist Reading Circle as well. Um, Claudia Jones School. I mean, there are many, many, many uh, opportunities uh, to study. In fact, that's another part of my Sankofa story. I think the summer before my senior year, y'all remember the political education group 
that met up upstairs in the conference room here at Sankofa. First time reading George Jackson. Whew. It was rough for a lot of different reasons, a lot of different contradictions. But the idea that we're going to meet every Wednesday or whatever day it was for three hours and read George Jackson, right? It's so funny. I missed a Wednesday once, and um, this brother who I think he worked, where did he work? Oh, my God. Wasn't a, he wasn't a student. He worked in the local community here in D.C., and I ran into him, ran into him at the Metro, and he even said hello. He said, you missed the study group. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't miss the study group. And I remember that specifically because we, we they used the word struggle a lot. In fact, I think the name when the convenience was called Brother Struggle. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, anyway, they called debate struggling together. And so I remember, and that's, that's come part of my language too, we struggle over the definition of fascism because, you know, Jackson talks about that in, in the text. And I remember um, seeing that same uh, brother again and he said, you missed the study group, fascism is winning. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think, like, Harold, there are so many of these things around, um, not only locally, but, you know, nationally. And, and now with Zoom, there's like Zoom study groups all over the place. She created one. I mean, so yeah, it's there. Contact us, and we'll contact the people that you should contact for this. I mean, really, it's almost overwhelming to think about all the opportunities that we now have to think and write and read. Also, the uh, Snake Legacy Project has tons of like archival materials, interviews, oral histories. I mean, the amount of information is so immense and it's not just you know um lim limited as one would assume to like black belt or dc but it's really global fantastic resource so snick legacy project is a fantastic one for people of all ages of all different kind of uh, educational backgrounds it's wonderful so definitely had to plug that and most of the stuff is free which is like, again, Black Study, Undercommons, all the things that we talk about in the academy being made available beyond the academy, it's being done. Um, maybe one one person's project is to maybe inventory, but be careful with it because you don't want to broadcast it to too many people, but create a database so that people can have, you know. Um, aren't you part of one, Eli, Beyond Prisons? No? With um, Jared, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. I can go around the room. What's the group? What is the most effective way to teach our history to six, seven, and eight year olds? Is there another question I can take? Yeah. We had one. So, so my, my question was in regards to, uh, we know that in Oklahoma, New Hampshire, um, also, of course, Florida, likely Missouri, and a number of in Arizona, a number of other states, they're banning this type of knowledge um, under the guise of calling it critical race theory. Uh, so uh, my question is, in the middle of these battles, how do you uh, get to those kids? And, and uh, similar to six, seven, and eight-year-olds, all the way through high school. Um, is there a way to disseminate these knowledge and these knowledge, these pieces of knowledge? And these scholars in particular, I'm wondering if they were engaged in that public pedagogy practice of trying to uh, engage this knowledge outside of the college classroom into uh, the, the minds of the youth. And there's one more, Jared. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with 
you mind taking three more times? That's good. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Hi, both of you. Um, thank you for this um, talk. The question that I had was, um, is Black Studies necessarily a political enterprise? And if so, um, what is the significance of it? And I think it kind of ties to the other questions that were asked as well. I'm going to try not to answer those questions with book and article recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael Thilwell's uh, Black Studies, uh, what is it called? And the policy. There's a, there's a Thilwell article on the political challenge of Black Studies. Um, I can get you the correct citation. Michael Thilwell, by the way, former SNCC, um, also uh, co wrote Ready for Revolution, uh, Kwame Ture, Sophie Carmichael's autobiography, but he taught in Black Studies. Right? University of Massachusetts Amherst. He directly addresses that particular question at a moment where institutionalization was taken over Black studies. And he says, you got to remember, this is a political, <laughs> right? And it's political because it's also anti-political in the sense that it's moving beyond the, nor the normative notion of politics, right? And so it's not a political in the sense that, you know, let's all try to fit in and figure out how this system will work for us. It's political in the sense that we're going to destroy the political <laughs> and then figure out a better way to live. And so that's the quick and dirty answer to that particular question. But I would definitely recommend um, this article by Michael Thelwell on that particular question. And I'll look up the citation and I'll get you the citation. Um, Justin. Your question, and y'all should know who Justin is, um, Justin Hansford. I'm going to mess up your title. <laughs> Director of the Thurgood Marshall Center for Social Justice. That's fine. That's it? <laughs> He's That's fine. Is that close? Civil Rights Center. Civil Rights Center. OK. <laughs> is it Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center? OK. All right, where did I get social justice? Did y'all get a social justice grant? I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> there's a there's a social justice something on campus. I don't know what it is. Oh, Asala and Mellon, social justice. Anyway, never mind. Y'all should know who Justin Hansford is. Also heavily involved in a lot of the work on internationalizing our struggle, which aligns with the work that Peter Bailey, who asked the first question, um, has been thinking about for the last probably five or six years in relationship to Malcolm X. And you all should know who Peter Bailey is in terms of his long distance run through um, many different ways of being and organizing around uh, black self-determination, including um, working directly with Malcolm X. So um, both of those questions are hard. And I think the way to answer them is probably uh, recognizing that one thing that Jacob Carruthers devoted his life to um, was building institutions beyond his academic job. Um, and he built several of them, at least three, probably more than that. Um, and the idea was, you know, we're on the south side of Chicago and, you know, people can come to, you know, the college, and they're also opening up the college to the people, right, at the same time. But everybody's not going to make it into the academy, into the university. And I think that's how we respond to this quote unquote CRT challenge. And that is where can our people go, right? Because let's be very clear, they weren't, do, they weren't doing education right before these CRT challenges, right? And so this is not something that we newly now have to answer. Let's be very clear about that, right? You know, and so just the threat of them making a minor corrective. And I can say that because I worked on the AP African American Studies course. It's a minor corrective. Just the threat of it, right, is now, you know, causing this moment where, oh my God. And so I think our mandate, you can use the word mandate, right? I don't think it's, it changes because of this, right? We still have to build alternatives. We still have to build sites where we're actually doing this kind of work that we only answer to ourselves, right? One of the things that I love about doing like events and you know, going around the country is there's a different conversation when 
we don't have to worry about whether or not somebody is going to come and kick us out of the room at a certain point. That's what Sankofa is, right? This conversation can go on and on and on until y'all get, get tired, right? If you're at a university, the secretary or the administrative assistant is like, y'all got five more minutes. <laughs> Even at bookstores, other bookstores, they keep it tight to 45 minutes and 15 minutes of question and answer. It's like, what can we do in that space? The same is true of, of public education, right? We know that there's going to be a start time and an end time, and it's going to be a certain number of days, but you can't fit the education that we need into that structure in the first place. And so we've always had to build the alternative, and that building has been ongoing. And I think now that people are energized by this particular moment, now we can get more people down to do the work. That's how I see it. Yeah, just to, and I remember we were having these discussions in Texas and, you know, part of the difficulty is that we get wrapped up in like refuting their claims intellectually. And I was saying to Josh earlier that like racism is not an intellectual perspective. Like you actually cannot like present an intellectual counter to something like that because it's not an intellectual position. So the only thing you can do is to continue to deepen, right, these alternative spaces, which were as Josh said, already in formation, underway, and being extended. Now they're under threat, and so we might have to think about ways to tighten up a little bit in the presence of this threat that's not new, but is intensifying in this moment. Um, but the idea is not to right do what we are, again, seduced into doing by the academy, which is you say slavery happened this way, why well, say it happened that way? They're saying that because they're racist. They're not saying that because it's an intellectual difference. And that's, we can't get bound up in that quicksand to, and we won't have the energy for the fight that is required of us. And I think one thing, and this might be a good way to kind of close that you can sign some books and talk to everybody, um, is one thing that this book does is it's less about what should we do what's the right thing to do what is you know the good thing to say or such in this moment but the idea is what is required of us politically and are we going to do what it takes to meet that requirement and I think that's something that this book emphasizes right because there's a difference between what one should do and what's seen as good and right and intellectual and, and, and such. But then there's also what is required of us. Are we going to do whatever it takes to meet that requirement? And therein is the answer to the CRT question, the idea of is Black Studies a you know, political? I, mean, that's, I think that's the question that this book puts on the table because all of those thinkers also put it on the table as such. And so do you want to um, say anything before you assign some books? This was great, thank you. That was really what we expected, but you know. <laughs> Dr. Badura Library is one of the smartest black scholars in the world. And when her book comes out, you all should come back for her book launch at Sankofa. Because what she is about to what she has written and can, is editing right now is going to reframe how we think about a lot of things. In particular, how we think about the ongoing nature of the crisis of black life. And we have a lot of people in our communities who love crisis <laughs> and love chaos and love thinking about crisis and chaos. And so to them, this book will be a challenge. How do we conceive of the ongoing crisis? So, is that fair? I think so. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I've read it in Amy's script, but I pr it's probably undergoing revisions. So many, but so that's, just, yeah. that's coming. And you know, you mentioned it earlier as Kendrick, and it got me to thinking about that very fact, right? And so, there's something happening in Black Studies that you know we all should be excited about too. Um, and there are other folks that we can name, but since we, the two of us are here, right, um, we got to be very careful also to protect our scholars 
who are doing this kind of work. Um, physical protection, right? Yeah, that's happening too. But also, you know, to put it plainly, and I want to say this in public, right? There's a lot of theft happening too, of ideas, of, con of, con of concepts, but also it's not that it's being stolen, it's being stolen by people who don't share the urgency and the political perspective that underpins the reason that we're writing this work. And so being in community, rather than having a conversation with a bunch of academics, allows us to not only fortify ourselves, gives us strength, like I said earlier, give us life, but also to make you all aware that we in the ivory tower, but they don't like us. And so we need y'all more than we need whatever benefits accrue to us coming from the university. Howard has yet to acknowledge that this book exists, which is fine. I'm just saying that's where we are in relationship to the so-called ivory tower, right? They don't want black studies departments. And so this is for us, which means we need you. This is a reciprocal thing, right? We need you. And so I just wanted to say that. While he's here, so we can sign it and thank hey, you. Michaela, all for you have directions to give? Yeah. That's not. Um, we have many copies of the book back by the counter. Um, I might set up an even second um, station there for you all to check out. Is there a high table I can have? Some books by the back counter. Uh, you want me to move to? She's in no. the back. I'm going to try and bring the last Okay. Thank you all. Oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, you Oh, you Oh, 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 Nice. Nice. I was First doing that for the camera. Right. <laughs> why I got the why, why I had to be in Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Just buy a book, I'll give you a calendar. <laughs> Where's your yeah. calendar? In broadcast. Oh, oh, hold up. <laughs> I got, I got one. <laughs> hey. Hey, check out Sankofa. There's events all the time. This is Hell Russian with my man Josh. We represent ASCAP. We represent all that. DC. Stay